Greetings, everybody, and welcome back to some more complex analysis. Today, I'm in the physics building, first of all, because the room I use in the maths building is never available now because there's classes in there all the time. Um, so yeah, in the physics building, and this blackboard is horribly old. Um, but yeah, what are we doing today? We're taking a look at the Casarati vice rust theorem, and we're going to take a look at um, some essential singularities as well. So we haven't really discussed essential singularities on this channel before, so we might as well dedicate a video to this. Yeah, they're pretty crazy things. They're like the, the bad boys of complex analysis. Um, so yeah, before we take a look at this theorem and whatnot, let's just do a little bit of a review of what an essential singularity is. So essential singularities, these are a type of what we call isolated singularities. So isolated singularities, well, what are these? If this points over here in the complex plane, if this is a singularity of some function, it's isolated if we can form some punctured open disk around it, so punctured meaning you don't include that specific point in the middle there, where a function is holomorphic on that disk. All right, so we've dealt with a few types of singularities. For example, um, let's do take a look at branch points over here. Now the thing with a branch point is that it always comes with a branch cut, um, and this is not isolated, um, because if you take a look at this branch point, no matter how small you make the open punctured disk um, around it, you're always going to include that small part of the branch cut. So it's not completely holomorphic in that open punctured disk. So in this video, we're not going to be talking about branch points at all, just these isolated singularities. And it turns out we can classify these isolated singularities. So there's um, three types of isolated singularities. Now, what are these types over here? Well, there's removable. So we've seen removable singularities on this channel before. There's poles. So we've definitely seen poles before. And the final one, which doesn't really fit into these two categories, these are the essential singularities here. So how do we classify this? I'll draw up a, a little table. So the thing is, if you have an isolated singularity, then you can form an open punctured neighborhood around there and your function's holomorphic on that little region or disk, which means you can set up a Laurent series expansion for f. So what might this look like here? It might look like, um, well, f of z is equal to the sum running from n is equal to negative n up to infinity of a n, and then we have z minus z naught, where z naught is your singularity, um, raised to the nth power. And here we're just going to assume that a, well, I'll write it down, a big n is not equal to zero. Right, so this is your Laurent series expansion. It has negative powers and positive powers. Now the thing with, with a removable singularity, you don't have any negative powers at all. So in particular, n is going to be equal to zero. Now how about with a pole? Well a pole, that's when you have finitely many of these negative powers. So n is going to be finite. And finally with an essential singularity, well you guessed it, um, this n over here is equal to infinity. So you start at n equals minus infinity, you go up to infinity. Actually, I should have put a negative n here. You have infinitely many negative powers. So this is how you can classify these singularities in terms of um, the Laurent series expansion. There's also another way which I find rather interesting, and this is with limits here. So if you take a look at the limit, as z approaches z naught of your function f of z, let's say, then with a removable singularity, this limit exists and is finite. Now with a pole, well what happens as you approach a pole, well your function's just gonna blow up to infinity. So this is infinity. And then what happens with an essential singularity? Well it turns out that this limit um, does not exist. So in particular what this is saying is that if you have an essential singularity over here, and let's say you have some um, open neighborhood of the complex plane, and now if you approach the singularity using two paths, so let's say one path over here, and then you have another path down here, and you get two different numbers, then it must be an essential singularity, um, because if it was a removable, it would first of all be finite. If it was a pole, then no matter how you approach this, it would be infinite, and with an essential, what we get complete nonsense. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of an essential singularity. So an example, um, well, it's very easy to construct an example um, because you can just take E and then just raise it to some function which has for a pole, for example. Um, and a very simple function, I think this is the most um, straightforward example, um, is E to the one over Z. So this, we can check, it has infinitely many negative powers if you 
um, Taylor expanders, for example, this exponential function, you get infinitely many of those positive powers, but then you put the one over z in there, and then you automatically get infinitely many negative powers. So this has an essential singularity. So s sin at z is equal to zero. And so we've just seen that essential singularities were they're pretty crazy because the limit doesn't exist, but it gets even crazier. And I'll illustrate with this little example here. So let's take a look at the behavior of this e to the one over z. First of all, what you can do is you can rewrite this as e to the one over and then x plus i, y, like so. So x and y, those are the real and imaginary parts. And let's take a look at how we can approach zero from different angles, I guess. So if you consider the complex plane down here, so here's the complex plane. Um, let's try to see what happens if we approach from four different ways, so along the real axis. So on the real axis, there's two ways to approach. Um, on the imaginary axis, there's also two different ways to approach, um, like so. And here's your essential singularity um, right in the middle at the origin. So let's take a look at the limit along the real axis first. So that's y is equal to zero. So if we ignore y here, you have e to the one over x, and there's two possibilities for this. Either x is approaching zero from the positive side, or x is approaching zero from the negative side. So what do you get if you take the limit here? Well, if x is approaching zero, you're going to get one over zero, positive zero, which is positive infinity. So this is infinity. If x is approaching zero negative, then you're you're getting e to the negative infinity, um, but that's just going to be equal to zero. So right away, depending on which way you approach on the real axis here, you either get um, infinity, or if you go the other way, you're gonna get zero. Now, what happens if you approach along the imaginary direction? This is where things get a little bit crazier. Um, so along, let's say x is equal to zero, then again, there's two possibilities. Y approaches zero from the positive side, or y approaches zero from the negative side. What happens in both cases? Well, if x is equal to zero, you ignore this guy. And I guess what you could do is you can rewrite this as e to the negative i one over y. So you multiply the top and the bottom by i, um, if you want. And what do you get? You get e to the i, and then some real number, pretty much, because of y is a real number. Now, when y is approaching zero, well, it doesn't really matter how you approach it zero, you're gonna be taking on pretty much every single real number because you have asymptotes um, at zero. So as y approaches zero, one over y, it's going to zoom through every single real number pretty much. And you have e to the i times every single real number as you zoom through it. And what do you get? Well, you're just going to be on the unit circle. So you're just going to be going around and around and around the unit circle um, indefinitely. And well, you can't really approach zero, but as you get closer to zero, you're just gonna be doing circles and yeah. That's crazy. So along the real axis, you get zero and infinity. Along the imaginary axis, you get, well, just a unit circle. And it turns out you can get any complex number you want. You just have to choose the right path. So let's say I want the complex number, I don't know, three plus i or something like that. It's a completely random complex number. I could probably figure out a path. Maybe it looks like this or, or something. And that gives me the answer. So yeah, essential singularities are absolutely crazy because I could pick any complex number I want in the complex plane and we could probably figure out a path that approaches the singularity which gives you that number. And this is almost what the Kasserati Weierstrass theorem is saying. It's saying well if you have a function with an essential singularity at z naught and it's um yeah holomorphic in some region around that essential singularity then your function comes arbitrarily close to any complex value that you want in any neighborhood of z naught. So let's just do a bit of a picture here because well, it might be a bit confusing. Let's say this is your z plane here, so your input space, and then you also have your output space over here, so let's say the w plane, and then your function goes from the z plane to the w plane. All right, so let's say you have some essential singularity right over here, so this is your z naught then what you can do is you can pick any complex number you want. Let's say this one right over here, so I'll, I'll do this in blue. Let's say I want to pick this complex number. Then for every single neighborhood of this essential singularity, so I might choose, um, I don't know, we can just use disks. It, it works out the same way. So every open disk, puncture disk here, I can find a complex number inside this disk 
so let's say this one, which maps arbitrarily close to this blue dot here. So there's a random complex number that I choose. So this point, it comes arbitrarily close to this complex number over here. And you can form a little disk around this complex number of your choosing and say f of this point, it maps inside of that disk that you chose in your output space. So yeah, Kazarati virus trust, it's saying you can go arbitrarily close to any complex number you want. And turns out there's something called the Picard theorems, which um, we definitely won't prove um, in any of these videos or probably in the near future because you need some very heavy machinery to prove Picard theorems. And yeah, maybe one day I'll understand the proof and I'll make a video on it. But essentially, Picard, it's a strengthening of Kasserati Weierstrass because what Picard says is you can get exactly every complex number you want inside of every neighborhood, um, but possibly besides one point. So what Picard is saying, well, I can pick any complex number, let's say this one over here, and I can find a number in this neighborhood which maps exactly to that point. Um, so to Kasserati Weierstrass, it was saying, well, I can come arbitrarily close to that point, but Picard is saying I can map exactly to that point. But with the exception of, at most, um, one singular point in your output space, which you can't map exactly to, but only arbitrarily close to. So Picard, this is just the, the stronger version here. And another way you might see this theorem written is that the image of f is dense in the complex plane. Um, it's because you can come arbitrarily close to any points you want. And that's roughly the, the topological definition of being a dense subset. So yeah, Kasserati Weierstrass is saying your image is dense in the complex plane, and Picard is saying, well, your image is exactly the complex plane, but minus possibly at most a singular point. So yeah, this is just the background material here, just a little bit on essential singularities and whatnot. And in the next video after this, we're gonna jump straight into the proof. So I'll be doing the proof now, but you'll probably see the proof in yeah, the next video. So yeah, go watch that video now if you, if you want to see the proof. Um, but yeah, otherwise, if you don't care about the proof, then thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.